Morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Jack. I'm a developer at Cedar. Um, I suppose that quite a lot of you at this point, but in case you don't, uh, that's me. Um, and I'm going to talk today about the Nearline Data Store, which is a kind of replacement for our migration app, the JDMA. Um, uh, but I'll go into that in a second. So a little bit of background. Matt talked mostly about this yesterday, um, but just to kind of keep in your head, we have different types of storage on Jasmine. We have disk, we have object storage, and we have tape. Um, and the real problem is that we want you all to use more tape because um, it's better, it's lower cost for us, obviously, it's selfishly, um, but it's also better in terms of being low energy and helping us meet our net zero requirements and, and maintaining low carbon computing. Um, we also want a storage solution that better utilizes our kind of cloud computing nature. Um, and we want to replace several of the legacy software systems uh, that we have going. So JDMA is one I mentioned, ET, something you may be aware of, which is a elastic tape, is a kind of old Python library for interfacing with tape. Um, so we want to replace that. And the kind of solution we come up to this problem um, is the Nearline Data Store, otherwise known as the NLDS, which is a hierarchical file management system. Um, and the idea is that you would transfer data between hot disk and warm object storage. Uh, I'm using a temperature analogy here, please bear with me. Um, and then in the background, once that transfer is completed, uh, it would automatically be backed up to cold tape storage. Um, at some point later in the, in the future, um, when the, the object store cache has been filled up, um, the files will be removed from warm storage um, via policies. And those policies are based on access patterns. So how frequently the data is, is accessed. Um, but from the user perspective, the idea is that retrieval from either cold or warm storage is done via the same command. So the only difference you see from your point of view is you say get, and it'll take slightly longer to retrieve if you're retrieving it from tape. Otherwise, you just say put this data and get this data. You don't have to worry about transferring between different hierarchies. Um, we also wanted the ingest and retrieval to be asynchronous. Um, we wanted to have a scalable Microsoft, uh, microservice architecture, sorry. Um, which is uh, a kind of way of writing software which makes it more maintainable longer term. So one of the problems with the JDMA is it's kind of uh, a monolithic piece of software written by one person, difficult to maintain longer term. This is hopefully a little bit easier. Um, and we didn't want to mess around with any proprietary formats for storing the data, as you may, uh, may need to in some, some situations. Um, so the kind of key design elements we came up with uh, to fulfill these criteria uh, are a RESTful API, because everyone loves a RESTful API. Um, we wrote a client library which connects to this uh, to this API server, and that uh, client library, uh, or sorry, and a client program that uses this client library. But basically, there's a command line tool for you to to interface with our API, um, and the API is published via Fast API, uh, which is the Python pack, uh, Python package. Sorry. Um, we wanted it to be portable. This is actually a stipulation of the funding we got from EasyWaste, um, so that it can be stored on any multi-user system. Um, and the idea is that you could use either uh, any S3 compliant object storage, which is on-premise or remote, um, as long as it's S3 compliant, obviously. Uh, we wanted to implement CRUD. Um, we wanted to make a catalog of users' data, which was searchable, uh, which I'll talk about in a little minute. In a minute. Um, we wanted it to be scalable, persistent, and fault tolerant, and of course, open source. Um, so this is what we came up with. Uh, a lot of this is not strictly necessary for users to know about, but I, I like showing it off because it's a nice pretty diagram. Um, uh, but basically what we have is a user that interfaces with a client at the top here. Um, that client talks to our API server. And then behind the scenes, behind the API server, we have a message brokering system. We're using Rabbit, RabbitMQ, but basically we use this to transfer messages between each of our microservices. And our microservices are basically just individual components of the problem, which we've broken down as small as we can, that run on individual machines, in our case, containers. Uh, and the idea is that each of these are encapsulated and easy to maintain. They just have a message going in and a message going out. Um, but what the user actually needs to know, what you guys will actually need to know if you're using it, is this. Um, so basically, there is a command line interface which communicates with an API server. Uh, that will put a message in a queue that queue will eventually end up processing your files, uh, cataloging what's in them, um, transferring them to object storage, and then eventually transferring them to tape. So from your point of view, all you need to do is say, put and get. Um, 
And so the catalog, as I, as promised, um, the kind of main idea here, this is the, the, the relational hierarchy of our database, but what you need to know is that the main kind of uh, information is stored in file. So we have a file, each file is part of a transaction. So when you do a put, that's creating a transaction that can be part, that can be, have many files in it, sorry. Uh, and uh, each transaction belongs to a holding. There can be many transactions to a holding. Um, each holding is unique to a particular user with a label. Say if you want to call your holding, which is your holding of files, uh, like rainfall data or something like that. If you uploaded with a put command uh, with the same label later on, that'd be added to the same holding. Um, we also have here on the right tags, which is basically just key value pairs for you to put in for extra information about the holding. Uh, this works quite similarly to properties on a stack record, if you've used that before. Uh, and then further down the hierarchy, we have uh, location, which tells you whether it's stored in uh, object storage and or tape, uh, and at what point it was last accessed. Uh, we also have a capacity to store checksums of all the files and eventually be able to search on that, but it's not implemented just yet. Um, so this is the list of commands. Um, obviously, the most important ones are the put and the get, uh, with put list and get list also being, being part of it. Uh, everything gets converted to a put list and a get list in, in behind the scenes. But basically, those are the ones you'll be using most of the time. And that's putting a single file or a list of files onto the LDS and getting a single file or a list of files from the LDS. There's also uh, the meta command, which allows you to edit metadata, so to edit those labels and tags I was talking about a second ago. Um, there is a stat command, which allows you to determine the status of a particular transaction, see how far, far through the workflow it's gone, whether it's gotten stuck at any particular point, or whether it's being retried uh, when being uploaded to the data store. Uh, there is list, which lists your holdings, and there is find, which lists your files. Um, and you can do that uh, with searching via a label or a tag um, with regular expressions uh, supported, obviously. Uh, and I was briefly going to go a little bit more into detail about the, the kind of arguments on those commands, uh, but I kind of decided that we have quite a good tutorial, so I might just very quickly breeze through this. Um, so basically, you need to specify a user in a group, and your user is your Jasmine user name, and your group is generally your group workspace. Um, and then you have optional label, uh, optional arguments, sorry, of label, holding ID, or and tag. So label and holding ID basically just allow you to specify which holding you want to add these files to, uh, and tag allows you to specify that optional metadata if you want to. Um, and that's the same for put and get, except with get, you've got an additional uh, argument, which is target, which allows you to, uh, to say where you want these files to be extracted to, if you want them to extract it to a different place. Um, and then basically the same kind of pattern holds for all the other commands. So list, again, user group, holding ID, tag, label. Uh, but in this case, uh, you can also specify a time because you can specify a time range of when these files are updated. Um, sorry, when the holdings were, were created. Uh, and the same with find, uh, and but you can also, also obviously specify a path. Uh, and metadata the same, uh, user, group, holding ID, label, uh, but also you can specify update tag and update label, which is the new metadata you want to add to your holding. So that was a lot of information uh, given very quickly. I'd suggest going to our very, very nicely written tutorial by Neil, uh, which is very detailed and gives you a good uh, introduction into how you would use the NLDS and uh, get the most out of it. Also put links up there to the GitHub repositories for both the client and the uh, server code, if you're interested. Um, but that's that's me. Uh, that's, uh, that's the NLDS, which is a, hi a hierarchical file management system. It's portable, implements CRUD, and is a single interface for your hot, warm, and cold storage. The idea is that you can simply put and get from the client line, and we do the rest. And it's coming very soon. And on that, uh, hopefully, hoping to get it released within the next week or so. Um, so keep an eye on that. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, you, you mentioned you use um, fast CPI. Yes. For the CLI part, do you use Cypher? Uh, I think we use Click. Um, just to create the request, which go to fast API. With that, yeah. Yes. One of the blocks on us using tape storage is that we uh, process whole missions at time. 
then we have to go and retrieve it. Um, we can't retrieve all at once. Um, so how do you link retrieving it, getting it, to then setting up processing jobs? Uh, how do you mean setting up processing jobs, sir? Well, if we're storing, say, level one data on tape, and we want to process it through a processing chain to level three, mm -hmm. then if it was on disk, then we just set the jobs off that, um, using a well, I've come to know as our workflow manager, I think. Okay, yeah. Um, it's our own. Um, so, but if it's on tape, we have to go and get a lump of data, move it to this, then set the jobs on. And yeah. that's a sort of very manual approach. Yeah. So you can you could uh, specify your get command, and then you'd need some way of of waiting for the get command to complete, basically. Um, and for that, you could use the stack command. I'm not sure I actually listed the stack command here, um, but basically that will continuously update uh, the process of your job. And then once it's, once it's completed, you could then start your processing. For example, does that answer your question? Okay. So and that could be automated. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Very much. It was designed to be automated as much as possible. We kept. The command line interface and all of the stuff that's returned uh, very simple you can optionally specify to return json as well so you can deal with, deal with it more easily within python as well um so yeah very much designed with that in mind So when I make a get request to get some data, mm -hmm. does that return the object immediately if it's in disk? Uh, so it would return the object if it's on the object store immediately to disk, yes. If it was on tape but not on object store, it would first move from tape to object store and then retrieve it to disk. But with the tape request, isn't that going to take minutes to run? So um, is that going to call back or does my request sit there waiting for a minute? Your request will be actioned immediately, i.e. added to a queue, but the job won't complete until sometime afterwards. So your will get your... some notification completion somehow. What's that mechanism look like? Sorry, say again. Do I get some notification that the retrieval from table is finished? Uh, again, you would need to do a stack command and check what the status of the job is, but that's, uh, again, another another request that would return so your holding in to check. Yeah, basically. Oh, thank you. That was a great presentation. I'm looking forward to this. With all group works in this now be connected to, well, they're already connected to the team, but will they all of them be connected to their own project store? Um, so there is one big tenancy, which is the NLDS cache. Um, Matt might be able to answer this more effectively. Yeah, yeah so what we're planning is that there's going to be, uh, uh, we had options of, of having like one object store tenancy per group workspace, for example, but I think it would probably make more efficient use of space to have one giant um, object store tenancy as the NMDS cache. But where they come up, you know, if there are use cases where particular projects need a you know, ring fence object store tenancy for, for that project, we can do that. Um, I think that might be a case of suck it and see how it goes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, so you're saying there's common NDLS um, tenancy for all the workspaces. Um, so you, you won't really need to interact with it as a as an object store tenancy though, because you, you, it'll just be a component of the NLDS system that you're using. So it's kind of and have it back in. But do we have the right to be able to access the NLDS if you want to? To, to access the NLDS cache object store directly? Directly. Uh, you can extract a URI if you want to, yeah. Okay. Um, I can't guarantee what that will do to your any of the S holding as we start editing your objects, obviously. Yeah. So you do so at your own risk, but yeah, you can access it, yeah. But there is a worry that other people can, anyone from a different universe, they can then edit on. Uh, so you, there is a, a certain amount of authentication going on and, and user roles and so forth. So you can't just uh, remove stuff from the big store that you, doesn't belong to you, for uh, example. Yeah, that, that's um, a significant improvement from the current sort of elastic tape slash JDMA systems that actually this does have authentication and authorization, yes. um, which is important. Um, 
just one. Oh, sorry. Sorry. You get it on. So. So the stated object, one of the stated objects is to retire elastic tape and change DNA. Yes. And you identify the time scale for which you're going to switch those off yet, or um, that's still to be determined. Still to be determined, I think. Uh, we're in the process of figuring out how we get the ET kind of holdings within into the LDS, same with the JDMA. I think roughly a time scale of probably six months, but Neil is the person to talk to about this. I think. That, that is the plan. All the current ET holdings will be. Um, Available through the MDS systems, I'm just not quite sure how long it's going to take. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, this is a very short question. Um, if I have a Jasmine account, can I use the tool from another system? That was exactly the question. Was... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so the NLDS is running on Jasmine. So yeah. if you point to a file that exists on Jasmine from any other machine, yes, that will work. If you're trying to point to local files on another machine, it will not work. Right. I was thinking of having a, another system within the same data center, for example, but I have a Jasmine account and I install the client on that system. Mm -hmm. And can I then call out and get data from, from Jasmine? Yes, yes, you can. Because yeah. I think one of the... <coughs> One of the use cases we're going to address was, uh, for example, pushing data straight to NLDS from, say, Archer 2. Um, so if you've got the NL, that is great that the, the interface can be public and that's actually. Yes, yeah, yeah. So you'll be able to have the client install that Archer 2 and then just push stuff straight to the tape and then only extract, well, onto, onto the NLDS and only extract onto your root workspace disk. Those data that you actually need to work with, and that, that would work. That, that sort of helps with the whole net zero aspect of it of only putting onto disk the stuff you really need to work with right now. Uh, just a quick clarification thing that I'm sure I've asked you before. Um, so at the moment, all interaction with tape has to be through the group workspace manager. Um, is this available for users of the workspace rather than just managers? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. I think, to be honest, users aren't really interacting with tape in that way. I think people would probably want to. Yeah, I think the intention with this system is that we've now got the um, set of roles and permissions for those roles worked out so that um, that will be the case. So, whereas before it was just the group workspace managers and one or two other non native individuals kind of thing, this would be just for. Potentially anyone yeah. um, within that group workspace. The different permissions would be like that the manager of a group work, well, whereas a user can kind of, uh, you know, read, write, and delete their own data, a manager can read, write, and delete the data of any user within that workspace. Um, which kind of makes sense. Any more questions? Uh, thank you. Thanks very much.